You are listening to the Techie Leadership Show with Bogdan and Andre. Hello and welcome to the Techie Leadership Show. Today with me I have David Mead. He is the co-author of Finding Your Way with Simon Sinek and Peter Docker. The book is designed to help even more individuals and teams find fulfillment in the way they do by providing a step-by-step process to articulate their why in an inspiring and meaningful way. Hey, Andre. Dave. Yeah. Sorry, the title is Find Your Why, Not Find Your Way. Oh, God. My <laughs> it's okay. AD People make that mistake is... all the time. <laughs> <laughs> find your why you're right yeah <laughs> you're absolutely right <laughs> and i promise i promise like raw unedited just make it nice uh, <laughs> podcast so we're we're going forward all right let's do okay. it so david envisions a world in which people thrive and find fulfillment in the work they do his role in making that world a reality is to propel people forward so they can do better and be better i love it I love it, and I'm really, really excited about talking with you, David. <laughs> Thanks, Andre. Nice to be with you. Yeah, same here. So, David, do you want to add anything else about yourself? Uh, I mean, it'll all come out during the interview, I'm sure. But I mean, you know, if um, just for for people to get a little bit more context, the you know, my background um, before I started doing speaking and workshops and that kind of thing was in corporate training. Uh, I spent several years doing sales training mostly, and I'll talk a little bit about that probably as we okay. go through the interview here. But, um, you know, that's sort of where I got my my start of, you know, sharing new ideas with people. And um, so it's it's nice to be able to take that experience and, and wrap it around content that really makes sense and really matters to me and hopefully can have a great impact on others too. Yeah. And that's that's something. If you can do like something you love and also have an impact on the world and help people have a better life, oh, amazing. Uh, so, David, I'm going to give you the choice. Do you want to start with the success story or the failure <laughs> story? What's your cup? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, let's let's start with the good for sure. Um, okay, start so- with the good. Then I will give you a choice. Do you want me to give you sort of, you know, the big, uh, the big company example, or do you want me to give you the more personal small company example? Let's do the personal one. It's, okay, you, you get more information from the personal, and it yeah, really yeah, is better. Of course. So um, when I was 18 years old, I got a job, part time job at a bagel bakery. Uh, bagel downtown bakery. Nice. bagel bakery. Yeah. Downtown, uh, Salt Lake city, Utah, where I live. Um, and it, you know, I, when I got it, it was, it was just a job. Right. Um, but that job and the leader that I had at that job probably has had more impact on who I have become as a leader and the things that I teach than anything else. Not because amazing necessarily taught me the most, but because that's where I really got the first, um, exposure to what great leadership really is. So I'll give you just a bit of a, you know, a bit of a background. So the, you know, there were probably at any given time and we were busy, we were right downtown on main street. So lunchtime, especially when all the businesses would clear out and come for lunch, you know, we were busy all the time. So, you know, on a busy, uh, in a busy lunch, we would probably have eight to 10 people working the line, making bagel sandwiches yes. and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and I cannot remember one single time that the the boss, right, the leader, the guy who who owned the store, that he was ever in there barking orders and telling us what to do, and you know we're running out of this, and you got to do it this not way. Not once. Not, not once. Whoa. He would. He taught us. He trained us well. We trained each other. We taught each other. We helped each other. And then he would just sit back and let us do our thing because he knew that we together as a team could work so much better than. Uh, than, than if he were just to, to be telling us what to do. So that was one thing that really stuck, stuck with me. The other thing that really stuck with me was he was always very interested and concerned about who we were as human beings, as individuals. He cared oh. about every single one of the people on that team. Uh, I remember specifically one time he, you know, he had a, a little party over at his home and he invited us all of us, uh, invited all of us over. 
um, and I'm not saying that, you know, this is what all bosses should do, but just to, to know the level of care and trust and uh, genuine concern that he had for me, as well as everybody else on that team, made a huge difference. And here's the really interesting part. So okay. I worked there from 18 to 19 years old, and then uh, I, I, I quit um, a couple years later. Um, I came back to him and, and he had left that, that, that bagel bakery had been acquired by a big national chain. And so now it wasn't what it used to be, uh. but he went and he started his own restaurant. And so I went and worked for him at this restaurant for four years. I was a server at this restaurant. Um, he has gone on since then, this is 20 years ago, right? He's gone on since to open at least two or three other restaurants in addition to this original one that he's opened. Nice. They are all incredibly busy all the time. And at least one of those, the one that, the one that I worked at, there is a guy who works there that still works there from when I was working there 20 years ago. I run into other people from time to time who have worked, uh, who worked with me at that restaurant or have worked at that restaurant uh, or for this guy from time, you know, every once in a while I run into these people, you know, cause our community is not that big. And everybody says the same thing about this guy. It's his leadership. It's the way that he, and, and he's very quiet. You know, he doesn't, he's not a very charismatic leader. He's not um, really out there, but he has this gentle way of leading people where they understand that they, that he cares about them. He cares so much about allowing them to do what they've been trained to do and not to step in and micromanage and, you know, worry so much about the output. He cares so much more about what he puts into people than the people take care of the output. They take care of the results. They take care of the numbers. And again, his businesses are thriving. The people that work for him are thriving. People love their jobs. I still, I mean, again, 20 years later, I think about this experience that I've had and it resonates with me so much just because of this, who this guy was as a leader. Oh, that's a really powerful story. And I'm glad I went with the personal one. <laughs> I know it's now do you want to because... be depressed? Because <laughs> I've got the other, the other opposite too. <laughs> okay. First, I want to tell you like my parents, um, one of their business that they had was a bakery, not a bagel. They also made bagels. And mm -hmm. it was here in Romania. And I know like, it's not glamorous work working in a in a bakery even if they have show now it's like being a baker now you can be like a rock star you can think about yeah. it <laughs> but you're absolutely right treating people like people and especially making sure probably he also knew how to get the right people on board yeah it's the secret you don't have to be like charismatic and give big speeches to everybody small stuff that you show them I care about you and you're important to me it's not just business it's also you put a personal note on it absolutely and yeah you just told like the results of that amazing mm -hmm. I am mind blown mm -hmm. um, do you think you, um, so this would be like all the secret sauce or do you have some other insights on uh, how he, why his leadership style works so great well, I think, um, I mean, there are other things. I think one of the, and, and this, again, we'll probably talk about some of this stuff later on, but he had certain certain characteristics. I think one, looking back on it now, and I didn't necessarily realize it at the time, yes. but looking back on it now, um, his humility, his willingness to, you know, not take credit for everything that went right but to give us credit when we did well, you know, when numbers were up, when we had a great, you know, when we had a great lunch with, you know, all these people coming through and no problems or, yes. you know, when we're, you know, at the restaurant, you know, we have our busy seasons or the weekends or all these things were going well. It wasn't, Oh, look at the great thing that I did. And, you know, this great team that I put together, it's wow, you guys really nailed it, you know? And so just make, you know, really taking a step back and letting us shine um, in the ways that we could. And it sounds silly because, you know, it's not like some high stakes business. It's a restaurant, you know, and we're serving food. But yes. still, this this also makes the point, I think, that we all have the opportunity to love what we do. We don't have to have a glamorous, high paying or high profile job in order to do that. We can love what we do. We can feel like somebody cares about us. We can feel like we're part of a team. We're part of something bigger, even if we're just serving plates of food. 
Exactly. And this style of leadership, I feel it would work at any, even Fortune 500 corporations, anywhere you would want it because it works. It just works. It and, I, and I love it because it aligns with other discussions I had <laughs> with mm-hmm. other people. And yeah. David, you, you promised that now I'm going to cry at <laughs> probably the <laughs> failure story. <laughs> well, maybe not, but um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a stark opposite. So I had a job, um, oh, I don't know, probably 12, 13 years ago now. I joined, it was, an, again, another little company for some reason. I don't know, I'm drawn to s- small companies. Um, but I was hired as the training uh, and development uh, guy for this company. So, you know, all the sales training that we were doing, I was putting yes. together all that curriculum and everything. The company, when I joined it was very, very purpose driven. They knew, you know, that kind of their, their cause, they were, you know, they had this great, these great ideas of helping to build young people into entrepreneurs and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. So I joined and, you know, things were going great. Um, and again, it was a startup. And so the, 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 the business model was, um, I don't know if you have it in, in Romania or anything like this, but it's, it's summer sales where essentially you'll get oh. a group of people to go out to different cities and they will you know live in that city for uh, the summer and they will go knock door to door to sell satellite TV or pest control or um, you know, whatever it is, uh, mm-hmm. you know, home alarm systems, those kind of things. It's a big thing in this country. So there was that sort of company we were selling satellite TV. And so, you know, the, when I joined, it was right at the very beginning. We hadn't had a summer selling season yet, but it was coming up. We were preparing for that. So we were hiring all of the salespeople that were going to go out. Everything was going great. You know, morale was fantastic. We were all so excited about what this company was all about. It wasn't just another sales company like so many others out there because there are a lot of these companies that do this kind of stuff. And the sale, the selling season came around and sales started to not go so well. And so yes. we were starting to spend more money than we were making. And so, um, you know, to make a, a, a fairly long story pretty short, the decision was made that we were going to bring in a team, a team of external salespeople from, you know, different companies that could just sell anything to anybody. And it doesn't matter how you get it done, but yeah, you just sure. sell the stuff, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden, this great, you know, vision that we had and this feeling that we had of, wow, we're really going to make a difference in the lives of these young people. All that sort of went on the back burner. And all of a sudden that was all about how do we make money? How do we do sales? How do we, you know, uh, keep the company afloat? Now I get it that it's important at some point, if the company is going, is in a position where we're not going to make it and we have to make money. Great. Do that. But what they didn't recognize was that they were out of balance. And all of a sudden now, you know, the, sh- the, the focus completely shifted to how do we make as much money as possible? And we never brought back this idea of the cause, the purpose, the reason that the, the company originally started. And that's when I started to really lose interest in the job because I could not care less about satellite TV. Uh, I could not care less about selling stuff door to door. Like that's not the reason I was there, right? I was there for... Yeah this bigger thing that we were all so inspired by to start with. Um, and so, you know, understandably my performance started to go down. I started to not really want to go to work. I started doing less and less and doing just enough, you know, not to get fired because I was still trying to infuse all of this, you know, this great purpose driven sort of idea or an ideals into the company, into the actions that we were taking. And it was just falling on deaf ears. So, um, eventually it came the day that, uh, I was, uh, in, in the conference room with, you know, my small little team about to start yeah. a meeting and they called me out of the room and they took me into the CFO's office. Um, and he sat me down and with like a robot with zero emotion told me that my position was no longer needed No, and that I had five minutes to pack up my desk and be escorted out of the building. Are you kidding me? Just like that? No, just like that. And on the way to clean up my desk, I saw the CEO who was, again, this, the biggest champion of the CFO had always been a little bit skeptical about this, you know, kind of the, 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 the money vision guy, and yes. this idea that <laughs> he's the money guy, right? Um, but the CEO, he was really the driver behind it. 
and I saw him on the way to my desk with my box to clean out my stuff. He didn't say a word to me. He didn't reach out to me. He didn't say, Aww. wow, thanks for the, all the effort and the time. And man, you've been here since the beginning and all this kind of stuff. There was nothing. It was just, this is the direction now that we're going. You don't fit anymore. So here's your box. Pack up your stuff. And it was just, it was, it was very disappointing. Ah, that's really sad. And that, that shows that uh, they started the business only for money. And that was like their only goal. And they tried to dress it up and maybe thought that it's going to work better and be more cost effective if they can do like propose a vision and get everybody riled up. But they weren't, at least from my point of view, they weren't willing to invest because in that vision and make it true and go through the growing pains of turning, making it reality. You know, I think that there was a, there were three founders of that company. And I think there were the, I think one of the issues was there was a mix. I think the CEO oh. was really all for the vision. I think the other two, the CFO, I think not so much at all. The other guy was kind of in the, on the fence in the middle a little bit, but I think because they were not necessarily united when the challenges arose and when the struggles came up and when, you know, these things began to happen, they were not united as the three founders of the organization. And so I think that's where the degradation happened. So I don't want to say that they, you know, that, that they started it only for money um, for one of them or two, you know, one and a half of them, maybe that was the case. <laughs> um, but you know, if you don't have that unity at the top of the organization, yes. I think it's a very valuable lesson. Um, then that's problems are going to arise, you know? Yeah, that's true. If you don't have total buy-in, like we're going to do it this way and we're going to do whatever it takes, we either make it or we're going to fail. It's no, mm -hmm. not not uh, trying to find solutions and, and say like, okay, we tried the vision part, doesn't work, let's, let's focus on something more concrete later on. Uh, it, it creates yeah. like like for the, for the people you get on board like yourself like you said like it creates a, a sensation that they don't really care like, like for example in the success story like the person really cared about people mm -hmm. if you feel a little like hey, I'm just going to I'm working here for the money you know start treating it like like that it's not something that inspires you to do something right uh, and with that, I'm really curious, what's your leadership philosophy? You know, I, for the last couple of years and increasingly in the last few months, I've been learning a lot about um, the Stoics. And these are ancient philosophers like Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus yes. and Seneca. And these, these guys, and I've, uh, I've been reading this book called The Daily Stoic, which gives you one simple idea or thought per day to think about. But stoicism is really around the idea of courage, self-discipline, wisdom, and justice. And it's really all around how do you lead yourself? Because until you get a handle on leading yourself, what you can control, what you can't control, how do you hope to lead other people? And so it's my leadership yes. philosophy is you got to work on yourself first. And then I'm not talking about self-help. I'm talking about how do we make ourselves better for the sake of other people because if our bucket is empty how can we give to anybody else right and yeah. so my leadership philosophy is really around um you know embracing our mistakes embracing our imperfection embracing our humanity but having a a constant desire to do better to wake up every single day to be better not for ourselves but for other people and we have some tips or how to do this? Yeah, I, I um, you know, and, and again, this is something that everybody can do if they choose to do. Um, but I, I've really sort of narrowed my, not narrowed my thinking, but sort of um, taken all of these ideas and put them into th to three buckets for me, which are, which really help to encapsulate the ideas that I have. To me, the tip number one is be honest. And when I say that, I mean, be honest in the way you behave in relation to what you say you believe. So if you have certain values, if you have certain guiding principles, if you talk about, you know, the way that you believe people should be in the way that you are, be honest with yourself and behave in those ways yourself. And when we slip up, because we will, because we're human yes. and we're not perfect, we're, you know, we're going to make mistakes to own up to that 
and be okay with the fact that, you know what, I made a mistake, but address it, be aware of it, talk about it and say, hey, I'm human, I'm, you know, I screwed up, sorry, tomorrow's another day, I can try again and do better, right? So be honest and have that consistency between what you say you believe and what you actually do. The second thing is to be humble. This ties into what I just said, but, you know, recognize that you are not perfect and you will never be. And that's For okay. Sure. Stop trying to be perfect, drop your ego, recognize that you're gonna make a mistake. Uh, you have faults just like everybody else. Um, but when you can admit that and see that and talk about it and communicate it, it does a couple of things, especially if you are in a position of leadership, when you're humble and people see that you make mistakes and you own up to them and you don't try to blame somebody else for your problems, they say, oh, wow, they're just like me. They make mistakes just like me, right? Yes. And when we see that other people are just like me, that's what builds trust. We don't trust anybody who says that they're good at everything. Oh my God, yeah. I think right? it's impossible, I, mean, you, I don't know. <laughs> you, read a, you read a resume, for example, of somebody who has nothing but you know, glowing things to say about themselves and they're a professional at this and they have, you know, they're an expert in this and they're a guru at this. We think, eh, I'm not so sure about that. But if, they, yeah. if you meet somebody that says, you know what, I am really, really, really good at, uh, at, at writing. But man, public speaking, I, uh, like, I, just, I really need a lot of help with that. We're more likely to trust that they're really good at writing because they didn't say, oh, I'm good at everything. I can write, I can, you know, I can speak, I can, uh, I, I can you know, I, I'm great on video and all these things. Well, we're probably, we're not all great at everything. So admit that you're not great at something. And that's when people will offer to help you with that thing that you're not great at, right? So have yeah. that sense of humility is number two. Um, the third thing is the third tip is just again to keep it human very much like my old boss did years and years and years ago to see the human behind the employee to actually care about them oh. as an individual ask them how they're doing ask them what you know figure out what and not being intrusive and being respectful of what people want to share but at the same time showing that willingness that you want to know about who they are about what they care about what do they what are their goals at work, what what are, what do they see themselves? Uh, what position do they want to be in? What what really excites them about the work that they do or not? And helping them to thrive and really under feel like they're making progress, like they're getting what they want to get out of work, rather than getting what we want to get out of them at work. Yes, that is so powerful, and it it all works like together. And it's really interesting that lately stoicism is seeing like a resurgence mm -hmm. yeah, yeah and it's, it's often um it's mis misinterpreted you know people think of the word stoic and they think of this person who is hard and has no emotion and you know that's not what it means at all a stoic so is a person it who it's a person who thinks for themselves who thinks critically who is disciplined in the way that they react to things um, and again, it's these really these four things, courage, self-discipline, justice, and wisdom. Like those are the four tenets of stoicism. Um, and it's about learning and becoming better, but not so that you can build yourself up, but so that you can be better for other people. And I, um, you know, one of the things I like to say is leadership is not being better. It, leadership is about being better for other people. It's not being better yes. than other people. Right. Yeah. And a story that I've heard, I don't know if it's right or not, about Marcus Aurelius, who mm. probably was the richest person that ever walked the earth. He mm. ruled the Roman Empire while it was in at his glory days. He had yeah. everything he could ever want. Mm -hmm. And he would stay in the morning one hour in bed to get motivated to get out of bed, mm. <laughs> thinking about the stuff he, he needed to do. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. shows, like, if you don't enjoy the stuff you're working, it doesn't matter how much you have. Right. It's going to be, yeah. like, a pain. It's going to be painful to go yeah. through Yeah, and you know what? I mean, the other thing to remember, too, is every day is, even if we're doing all of these things consistently, it doesn't mean every day is going to be great. We're going to have days where yes. we don't want to get out of bed. And that's totally fine. That's part of being human, right? Um, so I think we need to be, you know, while we need to to have this constant pursuit to to do better and be better, as I say. We have to also extend some grace and forgiveness to ourselves when we're just having a bad day. 
just admit that yeah. to ourselves and maybe to others who it's, you know, it's appropriate to admit it to and just recognize that, you know, some, some days are just a slog. Some days we just don't want to do the thing and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And the interesting thing is the more you embrace your inner humanity, that they're not perfect and you have bad days and good days and everything that comes with being a human, the more you get to see that the other people are also humans and they're flawed and it's okay. And you, you don't, yeah. you don't, you, you don't, you stop snapping at them because you say, ah, I'm perfect. They should be perfect also. And how could this happen? You know, all yep. these kinds of crazy ideas. In You're situations. absolutely right. Yeah. And again, we can't oh. extend that empathy or that forgiveness to other people if we don't do it to ourselves first. Yeah. And David, for aspiring leaders, what would be your top three leadership tips you would have for them? Um, well, I just gave them to you. Be honest. Yeah. I had say the things, suspicion. do the things that you say you believe, be humble, recognize that you are not perfect and you need help. Uh, and don't, you know, practice asking for it. Cause it's not something you can just do overnight. It takes practice. Um, and then three, every person that you meet, try to get to know who they are as a, as a person, as an individual, as a human and care about that. Be curious about that. Yeah. And since we talked about investing in yourself and developing yourself and growing and looking critically at yourself, what is the book that had the most profound impact on you? Um, it's a, it's a tough one because there are so many good ones, but um, oh, yeah. I, I mentioned it just a minute ago. And I think the one that probably has been the most impactful simply because it's, it's broken down into daily chunks uh, is the daily stoic, um, by Ryan holiday. And it basically, as I, as I said, it gives you every day of the year. Um, it gives you a quote by one of these stoics and then, um, Ryan and his co-author Stephen Hanselman, um, give you sort of a, a modern day explanation or modern day application of that particular quote. So it's just a great way to start the day and to think about, okay, what can I do today to, to again, have more courage or self-discipline or exercise more justice or wisdom so that I can make myself better for the benefit of others. Yeah. And I guess the trick to making it work is actually spending like five minutes, not just reading it. They said, Oh, I got it. But spend like five minutes thinking actively thinking about what you've just read. Yeah. And I mean, another tip I'll add, um, I'll give you a fourth tip for nothing. How about that? Um, oh, great. <laughs> the, the other three were free too. Um, but a fourth tip that I think is really great that ties into what you just said is not only do we, you know, start the day by really thinking critically about how can I make today better, but at the end of the day, and this is something, a practice that I've um, picked up in the last several months as well, take one minute at at least if not two or three, just to, at the end of the day, and I do it on a, I do it in a journaling app, but do it however you want, even do it in your head if you want to. But I ask myself certain questions at the end of every day. I ask myself, oh. how did I feel today? What could I have done to make today better? Um, did I uh, invest in my relationships today? Do I feel like I made progress today? Just replay the day and think to yourself, how, what did I do today to become a little bit better than I was the day before? that constant pursuit of growth is so important. Yeah. And it, it's amazing how, how often now I'm hearing while having discussions with people like journaling and keeping track and doing some introspection all the time. It's, mm -hmm. it's something we're not used as humans. I, 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 I wasn't used and it took me like, I said, I'm starting a journal and I, I would do <laughs> like one, two, three days. And then after two weeks, I would even, ah, I have to journal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, t I mean, like anything that, I mean, it's funny because I, I, I uh, listened to a, uh, a podcast with a guy, his name is James Clear. Um, he's an entrepreneur. I think he's written a couple books, but he was talking about habits and how easy it is to fall into the bad habits, right? The yeah. eating junk food or, you know, whatever it is, binge watching, you know, Netflix or whatever it is. And it's so hard to pick up on the good habits, like exercising yes. or eating well or all these things. Strange. And he made a really good point, which is that the, it's the, it's the reward factor because the bad habits all have an immediate reward that feels good right now. Yeah. And the, 
actual result or the actual outcome of those habits is delayed, right? You can eat McDonald's for five years and, you know, nothing really happens. But down the road, yeah. you know, you gain weight, you feel unhealthy, you don't feel well, you don't have energy, all this stuff, right? Um, but if you get up and exercise 30 minutes a day, it sucks. The immediate reward is not there. It's painful. It's hard, yes. right? But the, the long, in the long term, that's when we see the payoff. So that's the reason that hard or the bad habits are so easy to pick up because there's an immediate reward and good habits are so hard to start because the reward is, is months or years away. Oh my God. I just had like a revelation here. It's yeah. And if, if you, I am going to search like for ways to try to make like good habits and try to put some good rewards like instantaneously in, in doing them. And I think it's a good idea. To yeah. do it. Oh, awesome, David. And if people uh, want to find out more about you, where should they go, David? Um, you can go to my website, davidjmead.com. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at DM Propels. Nice. And I'm also going to put links in the show notes so people can more easily find you. It has been a true pleasure having you on the show, David. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andre. Thank you. Bye. See ya. That was today's episode. Tune in daily. Rate, like, subscribe and share, please. Oh, you can find further info and materials in the show notes on techyleadership.com, including links to the guest book recommendations.